um, how do you get color in ceramics, et cetera. And uh, this last round, well, the time before this, in 2018, we talked about how to design outdoor bodies, uh, ceramic bodies, to resist uh, freeze-thaw problems and to be robust in application. And then most recently had to do with energy and terracotta and the question about um, uh, CO2 generation or incorporation. So we looked at it for a number of different uh, perspectives. Uh, one is the energy cost manufacturer terracotta, and we compared it initially to other ceramic materials, um, glass in particular, and cements, because of, those are the big ones. And then with the talk last year um, in, in Buffalo, there was a question about other materials, and so we expanded to include alum aluminum, etc. So there's a perception that sintering, or the process of firing the ceramics, requires a great deal of energy. Um, and on the surface, that appears to be true. So um, you mine clay uh, out of the ground, you beneficiate it in some fashion. Um, you may blend several different raw materials. If you're making porcelain, for example, like for floor tile, you would mix the clay with feldspar and quartz. Um, and there's a energy cost associated with that. And then the material gets compacted in some fashion. Uh, it could be pressed or it could be extruded. And then it uh, gets heat treated. Uh, there's an intermediate step that also costs energy, and that's drying. Uh, drying uh, material requires um, a ridiculously large amount of energy, uh, much larger than is generally um, would be assumed. The drying process is, is very energy intensive because water requires a great deal of energy to evaporate. So the consequence of digging that material out of the ground, putting it back together in the form that you like, and then heat treating it, you look at the furnaces and they're obvious, obviously large consumers of energy. And so the result of that is that we have a, an opinion that energy required to make terracotta is very high. In fact, though, it is the lowest cost of energy per, um, per mass or per ton of any of the raw materials or any of the materials that we see commonly used. So we start with the powder. We center, the reason that we have to start with the powder is because these materials have very, very high melting points. And when I talk about high melting points, I typically talk in terms of degree C, uh, but the melting points are almost uh, uniformly above 1,000 degrees C and often in the range of, and they're not melting points, but centering temperatures uh, are 1,200 uh, degrees, 1,150, 1,200, 1,300 degrees. Uh, melting points themselves are 1,600, 1,700 degrees C. So it's extremely high melting point materials by comparison. So the question is how much energy is required and how does that compare to other building materials? So the densification process, I have an illustration here. These are microstructures uh, just for a porcelain body that was fractured. In the, it, when I have images, I typically put a uh, uh, diameter of circle in here that represents a human hair to provide a perspective. And so these are the microstructures of a ceramic material as a function of temperature. Now, this is not terracotta, this is a porcelain, but you get the idea. Uh, at 1,000 degrees C, the material is still basically a collection of particles. And as we go up in temperature, in this case, uh, 1090, 1135, 1185, by the time we get to 1185, most of the nature of the individual particles is now gone. So what has happened is that we formed a glass phase that fuses or bonds everything together. And in this case, by the time we get to 1280, that material is basically dense. Okay. Um, the density thing is really important for us. Uh, density means that if it's dense, it's impervious. Water can't get into that pore structure. The pores are isolated from the surface. And if the water can't get into the pore structure, then there's no freeze-thaw consequence. Um, if you get water into the pore structure, then the expansion of water on freezing, which is about 9%, can cause the material to crack and break, and we're all familiar with that uh, behavior. Um, Putting a glaze on the surface of a ceramic material in order to prevent uh, water ingress or get, prevent water from getting in, uh, it simply doesn't work. If you have a porous body, water will figure out a way to get in. It could be a crack in the surface of the glaze. It could be an area that's not properly um, uh, covered. It could be the backside, which is often not glazed in these situations. And those, uh, and under those conditions, that material will fail in use eventually. Um, if you wish to talk about that, um, 
we put together a talk on free saw behavior and the design of bodies for free saw behavior several years ago. And I found this reference, this guy, I don't remember his name, unfortunately, he um, compiled all of this data for free saw cycle in the United States. It's really spectacular. And we can talk about that later if you wish, or in another webinar. <clears throat> so let's talk about carbon. We look at an embedded carbon cost for terracotta or for ceramics in general. And at the moment, it's difficult to separate terracotta from other ceramics. And by that, I mean uh, difficult to separate terracotta from face brick or brick for buildings or from, uh, say, dinnerware production or from ceramic tile production. So we group them all together. Um, there's no uh, penalty for doing so because the processes for all of these materials are quite similar. So when I make a ceramic or a glass, like window glass or container glass, or I make cement, I generate CO2 from two sources. The first is the burning of fuel in the firing process, and that's the obvious one. So if I burn fossil fuels, if I burn um, um, natural gas or coal, or, um, or I, may, I burn coal or natural gas or, uh, to make electricity, um, there's still a CO2 cost associated with generating energy. Um, we tend to ignore that, but it's, it's um, inappropriate to do so. The second is the evolution of CO2 from the raw materials. This is a unique problem in general um, for, for ceramics, which is minor, but for glass and cement. So what that means is for glass and cement, um, glass uses limestone and soda ash, so calcium carbonate and calcium carbonate as their important raw materials in glass, and then that's added to sand, for example. Um, so if I make window glass, I have sand mixed with limestone and soda ash, um, or if I make container glass, I have the same thing. I have another component in, in window glass, which is magnesium carbonate, usually in the form of dolomite. It's not particularly important. Now, the thing is that these two materials produce a lot of CO2. When I make terracotta, I have almost no CO2 generation from the raw materials. Um, I have no CO2 from clay. I have no CO2 from feldspar. I have no CO2 from, from uh, silica or sand that's in the system. So my CO2 cost for making terracotta from a raw material is very, slow, very low. So I've compiled a list of that uh, material and, hang on a second, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Sorry, but my image on here is obscuring my screen. So I don't know how to minimize that. Let me do it this way. Ah, done, good. So um, these are numbers generated out of the literature. Uh, I don't have a reference handy. If you want a reference, I can uh, gather it for you. Um, there's roughly two gigatons of ceramics produced per year. That includes everything, terracotta, brick, um, dinnerware plates, sanitary ware, we call that after dinnerware, uh, tile, uh, is in that range. Uh, glass produces about uh, 0.13 gigatons per year. That's a billion tons per year. And then cement produces about 2.5 gigatons per year. If I break down the CO2 cost for those or the emissions associated with the production of those materials, I get the two conditions or two sources for CO2, uh, raw material sources, and then the costs associated with energy, CO2 cost for energy. For ceramics, there is no um, CO2 generated from the raw material itself. Uh, occasionally in glazes, you bring in a little bit of uh, uh, limestone, but the fact is the glaze on a ceramic body is a very thin sheet on the surface. And in that material, the most you would have in that thin sheet would be 30% um, uh, limestone. So your raw material CO2 generation is, is in the noise of the data. And so we can consider that negligible. It costs about 235 kilograms of CO2 per ton of product produced from an energy standpoint. And so when I round that, I get 0.24 tons of CO2 per tons of product produced. And that's this value over here in the far right. Okay, when I look at glass, roughly 25% of my CO2 generated in the making of glass comes from raw materials. The decomposition of, of limestone, calcium carbonate, and the decomposition of sodium carbonate uh, to form my soda lime silica glass. Roughly 75% of the energy, uh, the CO2 generated in making glass comes from burning of fossil fuels to make energy. 
almost without exception, the glass tanks are gas fired. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, e efficiency, um, ease of, of use, et cetera. Uh, and the fact that you're talking about huge tanks. There is a float glass tank, a flat glass tank in Geneva, uh, New York, that pulls from the tank 750 tons of glass per day. The tank itself holds 2,000 tons. The only practical way to heat that volume of material is with gas. What it works out to be then, and there's a lot of efficiencies associated with larger volumes, all that's been worked out over decades of use. So we're talking about 0.6 tons of CO2 produced by making glass per ton of product produced. Cement uh, is a little more costly, uh, well, quite a bit more costly in terms of CO2 production. We get about 37% of the CO2 comes from raw materials because you're mixing limestone with uh, sand, basically, and a few other minor things. Um, and that's 37% of the total energy cost. And you're uh, roughly twice that is in, uh, sorry, CO2 cost, twice that in terms of energy. So we produce a ton of CO2 per ton of cement produced. And there is a lot of cement produced in the world. So that's our big contributor of CO2 in general from the ceramic industry. Um, if we take a step back though, and we look at the energy cost, if you, if you will, required to produce other materials, aluminum is king. Aluminum is 250 to 200, 200 to 250 gigaton, gigajoules per ton. And I'm gonna come back and adjust those values for it. These are just energy costs. And when you go into literature, the energy is represented in different ways, but uh, copper and stainless steel are also about 100 uh, gigajoules per ton. Plastics, 50 to 100. Steel by itself, mild steel or, or um, uh, hot rolled steel, 30 to 60 uh, gigajoules per ton. Glass is then next at 12 to 25. Uh, there's a range because of type of glass produced. And there's a pretty broad range, it range from fiberglass, um, which is, um, and slag wool or rock wool, for example, for insulation, is your lowest energy consumption. And then your highest ener energy consumption is typically in float glass production. Plasterboard is next, and that is surprisingly high. And the reason is that there are uh, two large energy contributions associated with plasterboard. The first is that they mine gypsum and they heat it with steam. So you have a huge energy cost associated with making steam to drive off a portion of the waters of hydration of that structure to give you plaster of Paris. And then that is mixed with water, reprecipitates gypsum in the form of sheetrock or plasterboard, and then it has to be dried. So those two, uh, the steam generation step uh, to treat the gypsum and then the drying step are very energy intensive. That's why the cost for plasterboard is so high, uh, energy cost. <clears throat> Cement is five to eight uh, gigajoules per ton, which is consistent with our um, uh, 600 um, uh, kilograms per ton in the previous slide. And then clay bricks and tiles are two to seven. So we are at the bottom end of that scale in terms of energy requirement. <clears throat> um, why is aluminum so expensive? And it has to do in terms of the energy cost. Um, based on the number from the literature, oops, sorry, that slide shouldn't be there that way. Let's go to the next slide. Um, what I've got is that it requires 13 to 14 kilowatt hours of energy per kilogram of aluminum produced. So if I look at this chart, which I pulled out of an article, uh, really looking at energy consumption in China um, and the CO2 emission, emissions uh, for a kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hour of electricity produced, uh, my average worldwide is around 0.5 uh, kilograms per kilowatt hour, kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour. The reason that these values are not constant and the reason that they are decreasing is that there are several sources uh, for, for which to make electricity. Burning a fossil fuel on average in the world is of course the largest generation of CO2. Uh, and then if you get into nuclear power, which is much more common in Europe, and you get into hydroelectric power, which is coming online more in China, which is why there's a decrease in time, or decrease in um, CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour of electricity in China is essentially attributed to um, uh, hydroelectric power. Um, I'm not sure that that takes into account the cost of building hydroelectric um, facilities, but it's not particularly important. We can use that 0.5 uh, 
kilograms per CO2 per kilowatt hour. 13 to 14 kilowatt hours per kilogram of aluminum means that I have 6.5 to 7 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of aluminum being produced. So if I go back to my chart and I put all these things on an equivalent footing, uh, then you can see the energy requirement, converting that energy requirement to CO2. And when I get down into cement and glass, et cetera, I ignore the energy, uh, excuse me, the raw material contribution of CO2. You can see that aluminum, the cost, CO2 cost for making aluminum is uh, the highest cost of all of the raw materials that we see or all of the building materials that we see, where it's roughly six to seven tons of CO2 per tons of aluminum produced. Um, it's a huge amount of uh, CO2 produced to produce aluminum in the atmosphere. So it's worthwhile, I think, for us to take a step back and look at how aluminum is produced. So the way aluminum is produced is that we mine bauxite. Uh, there are bauxite deposits located all over the world. In the United States, there were bauxite deposits in uh, uh, Arkansas. Those bauxite deposits are now mined out. We have bauxite deposits in Jamaica. They're quite famous. Um, if you remember a few years ago, there was a, um, a red mud lake, which is not addressed here just yet, it will be in a moment, that uh, in uh, Hungary that ruptured and, and, and uh, red mud spilled into the, Dan the Danube, the blue Danube, so it is. Um, there are large bauxite deposits in China. Not all of those are able to be used to produce aluminum metal. Uh, and there's bauxite also in uh, uh, Australia. There are bauxite mines all over the place. <clears throat> so four kilograms of bauxite produces roughly two kil kilograms of aluminum oxide. It produces carbon, it produces, or uses carbon, it uses aluminum fluoride, it uses cryolite, and then a lot of electricity, it says 13 to 15. My 13 to 14 came out of a separate article. And out of that four kilograms of bauxite, I get one kilogram of aluminum. Uh, it's worthwhile for us to look at just the treatment of bauxite. This is, um, this is a, a slide that I use in my uh, uh, class. So what you have with bauxite is it's a mixture of aluminum hydroxide and iron oxides and hydroxides. And the problem is that the way that that rock appears in the Earth's crust uh, and in the mines is that those two materials are intimately locked together. <clears throat> so for some mineral beneficiation processes or ore pit beneficiation processes, we're able to extract what we want out of that material efficiently. That is not the case for bauxite. It's by far the most energy intensive and the most expensive process uh, for the beneficiation of a raw material on the planet. Uh, what happens is you uh, mine the material. Uh, it goes basically into a storage facility and gets crushed to do so, so that you have everything roughly the same size. It goes into a reactor vessel on the right here. That's actually where it's um, uh, being milled to get the right particle size. And then they inject sodium hydroxide, which is caustic. And then they inject steam to heat the system up. And what that does is it dissolves out the aluminum. So that goes into a digestion vessel. vessel. Steam is vented, the steam goes back to preheat. There's a lot of things here. And then they put it into a, um, this tank. And what they're doing is they're essentially facilitating that process to dissolve uh, aluminum. Uh, that comes in and the material that they like uh, gets off uh, of there as, a, um, uh, as aluminum oxide in suspension. And, and then what they do is uh, they, what's being pulled out is actually iron oxide. So that material then goes to settlers and they clarify that water if they can and what's left over the top gets reused and what settles out goes to a red mud lake. And red mud is a really um, nasty uh, material, very high pH, uh, meaning it's very caustic um, and it's primarily iron oxide and any other impurities that are incorporated into the bauxite and that material. Uh, there's a lot of debate, not debate, but a lot of people trying to figure out what to do with red mud. Um, very little application uh, applications found for red mud. So it's a waste product of this, this process. The, suspend, the solution then of aluminum goes into a tank that gets precipitated. And to do that, they introduce sulfuric acid, drives the pH back down, you precipitate aluminum hydroxide. Okay, that all sounds good. So 
All of this process up to this point is just to extract the aluminum. This process forward, you precipitate aluminum hydroxide. That material then goes through a dryer and then gets calcined to produce aluminum oxide that then goes on to make aluminum metal. So you see just on the front end of this process, the production of aluminum oxide is very energy intensive. I don't have energy values for each of these steps. That's not important. When I go to make aluminum metal, I take that aluminum oxide. This is just a cartoon version of that same process. Uh, the, you dissolve the bauxite to dissolve out the aluminum. Uh, you extract the red mud from the process, et cetera. You end up with aluminum oxide down at the bottom. That goes on to the next process, which is how do I then make aluminum metal? And the way that I make aluminum metal is through um, Hall Perot process, I think it's called. And um, they do it through electrolysis. So you basically uh, bring in, uh, uh, you set up a huge electromotive cell, and you bring in this aluminum oxide, and you bring in carbon, and the carbon strips off the oxygen from the aluminum uh, in the presence of an electric field to give you liquid aluminum. Um, there is no energy shortcuts here. I mean, this is, uh, the image on the right is actually a process uh, where they actually process the aluminum oxide into making aluminum metal. It's in a ridiculously energy intensive process. What we see on the end is aluminum. It looks easy. Um, it's not easy. It takes a lot of uh, work and a huge amount of energy to make that into aluminum. Uh, you may know that in World War II, um, uh, the, the Germans sent submarines over to uh, the eastern coast of the United States with the intention of disrupting the power transmission, uh, electric power transmission to the aluminum smelters and the aluminum processing plants because it was considered so critical to the war effort. So aluminum is a ridiculously expensive uh, material to produce. So um, one of the benefits we get out of terracotta is the ability to store energy for reuse. And the way that that energy is stored has to do with the heat capacity of the material. And um, uh, I have a couple of questions for the audience and Mitch, you can chime in. Do you want me to go through how energy is stored in terracotta or do you want me to talk about titania? Looking at our time. Do I have Mitch on the line? All right, we'll go ahead and we'll talk about this quickly and then we'll move on. So there's a couple ways to store energy and the, the way that um, uh, terracotta does it is sen essentially um, through what we call uh, heating up the solids or sensible heat. Uh, the material gets heated in the sun and then that heat is stored and then it gets re-released back. Um, I see terracotta as giving two opportunities. One is to store energy, and if we can harvest that energy uh, or the heat that comes off of that, we can then use that to augment heat in the building. The other thing would be to reflect the sun's rays away uh, to uh, reduce the cooling loads associated with buildings. Uh, we don't see any chemical reactions to, to speak of, okay? Uh, we have this sensible heat storage idea that the amount of energy basically that we have in the system, which is, is essentially Q, is the volume uh, of the V times rho is the mass, what our mass is times the heat capacity of the material or specific heat times the change in temperature. And so uh, what, is, what is of interest here is that terracotta is heavy, large mass, that's good for us. And then we have a specific heat value and then we have temperature which is dictated by essentially the sun. So this specific heat value or heat capacity is is how much energy is required to raise the temperature of a material by one degree. And we have a specific heat uh, is then normalized to uh, mass on a gram basis. So how much energy do we require to raise one gram of material one degree? That sounds a little bit silly. If you were in England, it would be uh, one pound of water uh, to raise one degree Fahrenheit. Um, and that's a BTU, a British thermal unit. So each material has a heat capacity. Some are similar, but I have a, I've tabulated those so you see an idea of what that is. And what's uh, interesting is this is the amount of energy then in, the, in this um, uh, column uh, necessary to raise um, uh, essentially water. How many joules required to raise water one degree? Um, uh, and what you see is that it takes a lot of energy to increase the temperature of water. And that's our huge energy sink then. 
So uh, you heat up water, it takes a lot of energy. Uh, that's, um, there's a consequence of that, right? And also if I want to evaporate water or if I want to uh, boil water, that's where the energy goes, is that it requires a lot of energy to heat up water. Uh, ice is about half of that. Uh, water vapor is about half of that. Dry air is about one quarter of that. And dry air, the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of dry air is the same as that required to raise the temperature of concrete. It is similar for terracotta. Uh, and then it is a little bit lower. The amount of energy required to heat glass is a little lower. And if I get into things like metals, that energy uh, goes down even further because they're good conductors of heat. And then on the right-hand side, I have the density. So most of our materials of interest here um, are concrete, terracotta, and glass all have similar densities. Okay. So uh, high density, high mass. If I don't like the high mass, I can induce porosity. If I bring in uh, a regular porosity, then I get poor strength. If I bring an open porosity, so I have holes through the system that are connected to the outside, then I have free thaw issues. And then I have an issue with poor shape. Um, Mitch brought up, somebody mentioned, wow, these pores, these shaped pores look great. They'll, they'd be great for water filtration. Uh, they would be great for water filtration, but they're the perfect shape to dramatically reduce the strength of the material. So we have a, what the orientation is, or the shape of the pore, we get a stress intensity factor. If the pore is a sphere, we have a small stress intensity factor of three, okay? If I have a highly shaped pore, then that stress intensity factor goes up and it concentrates the stresses then at the tips of these, of these shapes and that's where fracture will initiate and the piece will fail. And so here's your hair diameter. So you get an idea, this is a low magnification image of a terracotta material. We get pores that are shaped like this. We call them inkwell pores. So there's an opening to the pore and then you get a little volume. And that volume actually is not too bad for us in terms of, of um, strength issues but it can be bad for us in terms of freeze-thaw behavior. If I elongate that pore, what happens is then that I concentrate the stresses at the tips of that elongated pore, and then fracture will occur, and I get crack growth, and I get failure. So the orientation is critical. In other words, the, the direction that I'm stressing the system, and then also the shape is, is really important. Okay. These pores shown on the right, I don't have a, let's go back, I'll do it here. There's a hair, so these are the same magnifications. These pores are perfect for causing failure. And so uh, these elongated pores, these are also these long uh, pores here. You say, well, this is a big pore. Yeah, but the ends are blunt and these are very, very long. So the length of this pore is really important to the degradation of strength. Then there's your hair again. Um, one on the left here, would be quite strong. This is a good body for outdoor sculpture. These pores that you see here are isolated. They're not connected to the surface. In this case, there's a tendency by artists uh, to incorporate paper pulp into clay and it improves their handleability before the piece is fired. But the problem is that it really dramatically reduces the strength after firing. Um, it's really interesting. If you talk to artists who do paper clay, they will tell you which toilet paper to buy to get the best paper clay, which I find somewhat entertaining. Um, you can see the structure here. Uh, you have large particles that are embedded in essentially a dense matrix. These pores are isolated. That's good. This is the size of my hair in this case. Uh, anybody's hair actually. And then these are the elongated pores that come up from paper clay. These are actually um, really serious for the degradation of strength. Okay, so if I wanted to do something where I want to reduce the mass, I'm going to pay a penalty then when I reduce the mass in terms of my heat storage capacity, but I can reduce the mass if we're unhappy about how heavy the material is. The best thing to do is to bring in something that burns out. Uh, my choices are relatively limited. Um, I can uh, bring in sawdust, which is really common as a way to introduce porosity. I have to do that carefully or I end up with continuous porosity. So I have a limited amount of sawdust that I can introduce. I could introduce plastics. Um, uh, little beads would be perfect, but they're ridiculously expensive. The benefit of plastics is that they actually, when they, um, in the firing process, they actually help generate their own heat by burning in the process. So you get some boost in terms of your, in terms of your energy. And the temperatures are usually hot enough that the byproducts are CO2 and water vapor. We don't like paper fiber. Okay, um, shape pores are problematic. 
closed pores should be spherical if possible. Uh, if I can reduce the mass with spherical pores, I, my strength stays relatively the same, and I can eliminate freeze-thaw issues. And the way that I can do this, there's two ways. I can overfire the body, which means that the, the pores will bloat from a larger pore, but that's usually not desirable because I lose my shape, integrity, uh, reuniformity, or I can introduce a foam glass potentially or a polymer bead. Um, we think we might be able to stabilize bubbles by doing this. We have some ideas on how to do that uh, if it's really important to reduce the mass of terracotta. Um, here is an example. These are um, porcelain microstructures, which are not entirely perfectly related, but as I go up in temperature, you see the pores are bigger here, but the the hair keeps you on track. Uh, they're a little more regularly shaped and they start to grow as over fire because the pressure of the gas within the pore expands and pushes that material out. So um, Mitch asked me to talk about uh, TiO2 a little bit. Bill, before you go into that, the, the, just a two minute explanation of how terracotta is made because we, we saw the aluminum process as an example of complexity. Okay. And uh, if you could just briefly describe it. Yes. Um, give me a second. I might be able to actually do that um, with, a, with a presentation from last year. Let's try uh, this one. Oops. So terracotta basically, raw material comes in and um, and gets um, processed into a powder. Material that comes out of the ground is typically um, already in a form that can be used. Let me see if this one's it. Um, let's try this. I'm gonna get out of that thing. Let's try this. Sorry, uh, here we go. Forming processes. So raw materials come out of the ground. Raw materials are then processed. Uh, we prefer uh, uh, to, we mix some material with water in the right proportions. So in a terracotta body, you'll have uh, several raw materials. Uh, there's clay, they bring in a coarse particle grog, which is uh, just a filler basically. Uh, they'll bring in fluxes to help form glass in the system. Uh, and then uh, that material is mixed together. We can slip cast articles. So we make a suspension, they go into a gypsum mold and, um, uh, or a plaster of Paris mold as they're commonly called. And then the mold sucks the water out and leaves behind a shape. Uh, and that's a common way to make complex shapes. Uh, the downside of that is it's very labor intensive. Um, so you need a skilled operator. Um, they need to pay attention to the process um, they often drain cast, meaning they'll cast until they get, get a given wall thickness, and they dump the remaining material out. And then that material starts to dry and it shrinks, pulls away from the mold, and they can remove the part. And that process is, um, requires skill because the piece that's coming out is large and often will have the potential to deform, and you don't want to deform it because that creates problems. So they're, they're, they build the molds in such a way that the pieces come out easily. That usually helps. You get more shrinkage that way, um, so you compensate for that. Ram pressing is a plastic body, lower water content. You don't get as much deal, but you can detail, but you can reproduce large objects. Um, lower shrinkage, high uniformity. The cost has to do with making other ram press molds, so there's a, a cost in that end. But uh, if you're making a lot of pieces that are all similar, that's an economic way to do it. If you have a uniform cross section, you can go to a plastic body extrusion. Boston Valley does a lot of this. Um, they have large extruders. My guess would be in the order of 18 inches in diameter is the actual auger. And it pushes material through a die and then that material gets cut um, and you end up with a, uh, a cross section with ribs. Uh, you have a, a uniform cross section in that way and you can make a large number of efficient efficiency large number of pieces efficient, excuse me, particularly for long pieces such as, uh, um, you know, columns or exterior, what do they call them? Um, I don't know what to call it. And then last and most labor intensive is hand forming. Uh, sometimes they are done freely, meaning that they have a large block of clay and they carve it. 
Sometimes they're uh, pressing plastic body into molds and then they clean that up afterwards. Uh, potentially higher shrinkage. Um, it's possibly isotropic, but it isn't necessarily isotropic, meaning that you can have some preferential shrinkage directions. Uh, it requires a great deal of skill. Um, Boston Valley started there, particularly with um, um, restoration work and then evolved into uh, more of the extrusion and the more uniform cross sections and larger pieces and rain screen and what have you. Okay, uh, cartoon version of uh, slip casting, how it works, and you can see uh, the guy slip casting up here for a complex piece. So you fill the mold, you drain the excess, this shrinks away, you take your piece out. Okay, works very effect effectively. Ram pressing piece comes in. Um, this is a large ram press, they're pressing a large piece, and then you get that uniform cross section, you pull it out, then you uh, force air in to release the piece and dry it. Okay, efficient. Um, extrusion, and there's your uniform cross section being extruded. The auger is back here someplace um, off screen, and you can see the complexity of the piece. And then uh, this is hand forming. So for pieces that are unique, you know, like this idea in the bottom left, uh, hand forming, sometimes I work with a mold, sometimes not, um, but that's the forming process. Um, I think we don't have to talk about plasticity unless you just really want to talk about plasticity. No, thank you. Titania is up next. Okay. So Titania um, literature right now is pretty hot with Titania. Um, they like Titania. It's been demonstrated to be a photocatalyst. Um, what's missing there is that uh, you should be aware that there are three mineral phases for titania, rutile, anatase, and brookite. Um, catalysts are typically made of anatase or brookite. Brookite actually is really rare, and it's extremely fine particle size. Fine particle size meaning on the scale of nanometers. Uh, rutile is the form that's used in founding glazes. So catalysts, though, require high surface area, and they require extremely fine particle size to get that surface area. And what happens with anatase and rutile is as you heat them up, um, as that particle size grows, even a little bit, uh, brookite becomes unstable and converts to anatase. And then as you continue to heat, anatase becomes unstable and forms rutile. So rutile is low surface area and it has a large particle size. So in a glaze, though, what happens is that um, we use rutile as a colorant in glazes. Uh, you get browns and tans, etc. cetera, um, as that material as a, as a colorant. If you have rutile in a pure form, which is actually kind of rare. It's also used as an opacifier. An opacifier is something that uh, essentially scatters light. So you go from a transparent or translucent glaze to an opaque glaze. Um, and what that does for you is it improves your color response. So because terracotta is usually not white, uh, it can be a buff color to a deep brown. Uh, you might put a coating on a glaze or an ongo, which is like a, uh, another glaze that is opacified so that you, you have the brown underneath, it's obscured from view uh, by the coating, and then your glaze goes on top of that for your color. Rutile commonly contains a substitutional iron, meaning iron goes into that rutile lattice substituting for titanium, and then you have a mineral called illite. And illite has a broad range of colors, ranging from tan to brown, depending on the amount of iron. Um, when I put rutile in a glaze, it becomes a part of that glaze and gets encapsulated by the glass and therefore uh, in, inaccessible. Sorry, that should be a no gap there between in and accessible. The, the rutile in the glaze is actually, it gives you color, you can see it, um, but it isn't actually accessible to the outside atmosphere. That means there's almost no potential whatsoever of catalytic activity on the surface of that glaze. So you might say, well, how do we get that catalytic activity? What we would have to do is that we would need to add that titania in as a separate step. It has to be done as a surface treatment after the piece has been fired, after we form the glaze on the surface, we would come by and come back and treat that probably with an organic uh, compound that contained titania. And then we would go through an additional firing. So we would take that material back into the kiln, and we would heat it up with the idea of burning off the organic and precipitating back these very fine particle of anatase on the surface. <clears throat> so um, if I heat that too far, that anatase then converts to rutile and my benefit would go away. Uh, but the result of that low temperature firing with anatase on the surface is that that coating durability will likely be very poor. 
small particles will adhere to the surface, uh, but they're not going to be particularly mechanically durable, uh, meaning that if they get scraped or bumped into, um, they'll scrape off. The other thing is that this is expensive. Uh, when you go to uh, titanium isopropoxide, for example, organic material containing titanium, uh, that's expensive. And then you also have a third firing because you're going to, uh, or at least a second firing. So if you make the terracotta piece and you glaze it and you fire it in one step, you're good. If you bisque fire, fire to a low temperature and put your glaze on and you have a second step. But in this case, you're going to be, if you've already got the glaze on, you've got to do this step. That's a third, a second step or a third step, uh, depending on, um, on how you're making the piece in the first place. So you're adding uh, another production level cost to that that makes this very expensive. So uh, that wraps it up for me um, in general. Terracotta I think is very competitive, arguably better from an energy and CO2 cost perspective. The perception is that it's expensive to do, uh, but in reality it's one of the lowest cost CO2 costs of any of the materials and it's also one of the lowest energy costs. I think it is the lowest energy cost. Uh, for energy storage it's competitive because of the mass. So there's a benefit to that. The trick then is how do you harvest that energy or reuse that energy? Um, and then unfortunately, titania is not really a good opportunity for a catalyst. It does give us some color opportunities, particularly browns and tans, but not, um, uh, not catalytic activity. So um, that wraps it up for me. How do I get, how do you get you back? I'm sharing my screen, I wanna see the Uh, help me out here. There we go. I'm looking at this the chat. Oh, three. Good. Okay. Uh, the, can you see the question, does terracotta use the same names for dryness as clay, i.e. soft leather, hard leather, etc.? Yeah, those terms are actually terms uh, that are uh, historical terms that are not very commonly used anymore. But yes, they use the same terms. Uh, leather hard is the one that's typically used. Um, and we don't usually see soft leather. We see, um, uh, typically they might say that it is plastic. Is that helpful? Sure. Um, anyway, folks uh, wanna type in some more questions. We have about five minutes or we can uh, call it a webinar. Okay, can a reinforcing material be added to terracotta prior to firing? No, not typically. So the problem you have in firing is that most, there are a few materials that can handle the temperatures, metals that can handle the temperatures in firing. Um, you could go with a stainless steel um, or some of the high temperature stainless steels, but they're gonna be difficult. Um, uh, what happens is that at those temperatures, um, even if you have stainless, you'll start to oxidize the iron. And when you oxidize the iron, it expands. Um, and, and that's a problem. So the other thing it does is it will tend to um, discolor uh, quite a bit. Um, if you do things like fiberglass, fiberglass temperatures are actually far below the temperatures required to sinter terracotta. So the key to terracotta in terms of strength is really um, how to well, putting the material in compression, and <clears throat> it has actually quite good strength in general. Um, but no, the ability to introduce a reinforcing material is going to be difficult. Uh, it says, so with extruded terracotta, the most energy consumptive part is the assembly is the aluminum attachment for a rain screen. Ah, uh, yeah, I think you're right. It's interesting to do um, an analysis of the mass of aluminum versus the mass of terracotta and what your energy cost is. I wouldn't be surprised if you would find that you are equivalent, that your aluminum attachments, even though a small part of it, um, are the same energy or CO2 as, as the terracotta is. So uh, one thing that Peter mentioned to me about a way of reducing the amount of aluminum is uh, how you hang the terracotta. Okay. Uh, so uh, Peter, I forget what the savings could be uh, if you, um, uh, turn them from horizontal bands to vertical bands. There's a substantial saving because you don't have to clip them as many times. 
instead of every 18 inches, which is what you need to do on a, on a um, horizontal band. Uh, so, it, we'll, you wanna... we'll go from that. There are a couple other questions. We'll, we'll address that in a later time. Okay. okay. So, um, how does terracotta compare to natural stone in terms of energy cost, CO2, life cycle? Well, the, the cost of natural stone, right, you have to cut it. Uh, you have to extract it from, uh, uh, from the ground in some fashion. And um, uh, I don't know what the energy cost is associated with cutting. I would assume it is still less, but the best than terracotta. Um, the problem is, is um, availability, it seems to me. Um, I don't see any difference, real difference between uh, granite, for example, and um, um, say marble, except that your uh, cutting tool costs are going to be higher for granite typically. But in both cases, you're probably going to use diamond tooling. You just have longer lifetimes on the, on the, um, the marble applications. Um, I don't have numbers for energy costs associated with natural stone. Um, extruded terracotta is anisotropic, which is a strong direction. Uh, great question, uh, uh, my issue. Um, anisotropic is really referring to the shrinkage. So you get sh more shrinkage typically perpendicular to the extrusion direction <laughs> than along the extrusion direction. So from that perspective, it's anisotropic. Um, in that they have to compensate for the difference uh, in the shrinkage versus on orientation. But in terms of strength, we don't typically see that there's a significant difference in strength from one orientation to another. For cast in place concrete, there, is, there are instances where voids are introduced material by using hollow spheres during concrete. Um, yes, so during the concrete pour, yes, that's possible with terracotta, depending on what the spheres are. In concrete, you can use um, uh, glass spheres or polymeric spheres. I don't know what they use actually, um, uh, but they they are uh, they don't withstand the firing temperatures. So we've been kicking around the idea of how to create a clay-based sphere that doesn't melt, so that you end up with being able to maintain that sphere. So the the simple answer is yes. The tricky part is how to do it affordably. Um, can salt water be used in the creation of the slip? <laughs> well, great question. Um, it does not affect the composition of the terracotta, it's minor, uh, but it does affect the way the particles interact. And so what happens is if you use salt water to make the slip, your viscosities are typically much higher. And the reason is that the particles have a tendency to agglomerate. And what that means is that in a slip cast piece, you will get a higher shrinkage associated with that material on firing produced with salt water compared to one produced with, with clean water or potable water. So it's an interesting um, uh, problem because the, um, if you use salt water, um, uh, well, there's some other potential advantages, very, very high casting rates, fast casting rates, but you pay for it in shrinkage. And, um, and then the more shrinkage you have, you have problems associated with firing. Because they're big, heavy blocks and they tend to drag on the edge. That means you can create uh, problems associated with that high level of shrinkage. The way the terracotta is typically recycled is by crushing and incorporating the uh, crushed material back into the raw body as a grog. Um, there is, of course, an energy cost associated with crushing, and crushing tends to be a relatively inefficient process. Um, but that's the way that that would be done. Can terracotta taken off a building for restoration be recycled into the new terracotta? Uh, it can. Um, there's a question about whether uh, it's uh, affordable. So you're going to take the material off the building. You have to truck it to some place to that will do the crushing. Then the crushed material goes to uh, the factory that makes the terracotta, gets incorporated into the batch. Um, you can see that there might be huge problems associated with logistical problems of, oh, we only want to use grog that came off of this building to make the new pieces. Uh, it's a great story. Um, but it's not one that's probably practical. Um, <laughs> can you discuss the environmental impacts of harvesting clay and other natural materials for terracotta? Uh, I have another presentation on that. Uh, the clay companies have gotten smarter, just like everybody else who does mining. 
and they go back and they reclaim the land afterwards. Um, clay uh, mines, there are not that many of them uh, around. They're typically they're almost exclusively strip mines. Uh, ancient China, actually, they were underground mines, interestingly enough. But here, they're all uh, strip mines. Um, I have a, if you're interested down the road, I have a presentation on clay beneficiation and clay mining. Um, I got these great results from a clay company in Kentucky, and they uh, showed how they bore holes, look at the mining, and then they make uh, determinations for uh, what they mine based on the ratio of overburden to uh, the material they're mining. And then in the end, um, they uh, reclaim the land, you know, build lakes, recreation. So I don't know how to answer your question other than that. Can you form core clay spheres by rotary molding processes, use those in voids? Uh, we're kicking around that idea. Typically you would do um, granulation technology. Uh, we do pan granulation or disc granulation. We do pin granulation. Uh, we have mixers that will help us granulate. The problem with granulation is that I don't get a hollow sphere. I get a low, I can get a low density sphere, but not a hollow sphere. So um, we're trying to figure out if we can do that um, economically. <clears throat> and our thoughts that we might be able to do it by actually stabilizing a bubble. And then you're creating voids that are about 100 microns. And as a frame of reference, uh, your hair is about 60 microns, so 100 microns is roughly perfect. Uh, can I repeat the answer for direction strength? Yeah, the anisotropy in extrusion has to do with shrinkage, not with strength. So what you get is uh, in the direction of extrusion, you tend to have less shrinkage than you do perpendicular to that direction of extrusion. So what you have is that um, it will shrink more uh, perpendicular to the extrusion direction than it sh shrinks in the length of the extrusion on a percentage basis. And, and so that shrinkage is anisotropic. The strength, um, the way that we measure strength and what we have measured for strength appears to be independent of the orientation. So if I cut pieces that are perpendicular, I test perpendicular to the extrusion direction versus testing in parallel to the extrusion direction, I don't see a change in strength. So in other words, um, the anisotropy has to do with shrinkage. It doesn't have to do with strength. Um, I think that about wraps it up. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, be interested in hearing your responses. Additionally, if you have um, other questions that occur, uh, please uh, email them to me and I'll get them um, addressed. Um, the last one came in. I'll, I'll, do you want to say something really quick? And I thank you. In the uh, after Car Dr. Cardi answers this last question, we will close the webinar. But uh, it will be posted to the web for anybody who wants to pass it along to uh, well, colleagues. Yeah. So uh, the answer is no. That was easy. Um, I have, have. Do you know anyone who has tried or experimented with use of different material for the hanging of extruded terracotta components for facade application in lieu of energy intensive aluminum attachment? and clip components. Um, here we go. Peter's Valley used steel, fiberglass, and concrete. But I don't have any experience with that, so we're all set. Thank you all. Bill, thank you very much. We really appreciate you. My pleasure. Bye, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you.